Welcome to season three of the Yoga Therapy Hour podcast. My name is Amy Wheeler and I'm your host. We are so happy to tell you all that's happening in the world of yoga therapy. And we love to find guests from all over the world so that we can share and learn and grow together. Some of the things that are happening in season three that we find so exciting is that not only are we continuing with the free gift that we are giving out every single week in season two, and you can see more about that in the show notes, but now we are adding a YouTube channel and you can see all of these podcasts on video. The YouTube channel is called Optimal State with Amy Wheeler. Some people like to watch video. Maybe you want to use it for one of your trainings. These videos on YouTube will be there for you to use for free. We would love your support. We have opened up a Patreon page that is going to help the podcast flourish and grow. You can help us to expand and grow and create more content for you. And we'd love for you to visit the Patreon page, which is called Optimal State and Yoga Therapy Hour podcast. So let's go into our guest today and please nourish yourself, take time for yourself and really relax into listening to the podcast. Today, I'd like to welcome Lori Highland Robertson, who is the IAYT Editorial Director, and she's part of the conference organization team for SITAR 2022. So first, Lori, welcome. Thank you for coming today. Thanks so much, Amy. It's such a pleasure to be with you. I think a lot of people wonder, what does sitar mean? I mean, we think of it as a a beautiful musical instrument from India, but what does S-Y-T-A-R stand for? It is the Symposium on Yoga Therapy and Research. And this is IAYT's, so the International Association of Yoga Therapists. We love our acronyms, you know. This is IAYT's annual practitioner conference. So for yoga therapists, yes but also for yoga researchers and other kinds of yoga professionals and other kinds of integrative health professionals. And I would also say 200-hour or 500-hour yoga teachers who might be considering getting into yoga therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a wonderful way to get your feet wet and meet people and see what's what in the world of professional yoga therapy. What are people thinking about? What are they working on? What approaches are they taking to clinical practice? Well, we're going to get back to that in a minute, but let's just first start off with the basics. And that is that we've not been able to have a live in-person conference for two years now. And this one is June 9th through 11th, 2022, just outside Chicago. What a wonderful place for people to come back together after this long absence of meeting of the hearts. So it's at the Lincolnshire Marriott Resort, and they're also going to have an online version, I understand, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So, so Lori, let's just start off with kind of the overall big idea, right? If somebody's like, why do I want to go to this sit to our conference, spending my precious time, energy, money, focus. I think the big idea or the big theme this year is that there are so many different approaches to clinical care that one of the beautiful things about the International Association of Yoga Therapists is that they have been very, very inclusive to many different styles and traditions of yoga and that everyone gets to be under the big tent and that no one is better than anyone else. We all are just taking different roads to the mountaintop. And especially when it comes to clinical care, can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Different approaches to clinical care. It's a wonderful question. And as you said, there's no particular yoga lineage that is preferenced above others in in the association. So this conference is a wonderful opportunity to get to learn from other professionals because as we get deeper into our yoga studies, we will naturally tend to study, right, one approach very deeply. And so we might not be exposed to these different ways of 
thinking and different settings even in which we might find ourselves practicing. So that's part of it too. What settings are people working in? Are they in a hospital? Are they in a military facility? Are they in private practice for themselves? And what does that look like? So that's part of what we'll be diving into in this conference. And and as you said, it's in Chicago. So for those who are able to travel in person, it's a wonderful central meeting point. Mm. kind of in, in, you know, for those in North America and easy to get to for those who are not in North America. You know, I get asked that all the time, like, what can you do once you become a yoga therapist? And I made a list of 50 different types of care that you could give, right? So it's, it's really such a broad spectrum. So along those lines, we have one of our keynote speakers this year is Catherine Cook Catone. And she's talking about yoga therapy, embodiment, and pathways to healing. Can you tell us a little bit about her talk and and what she's going to be offering in her keynote? Yeah, Yeah. Dr. Cook Catone is a great example of the different settings that we can do this work in. And she's also a wonderful example of a professional who has brought yoga into another modality. So she is a yoga researcher, first of all. She's also a psychologist, Mm -hmm. and she does a lot of work in the eating disorder space. So she'll be talking about approaches to eating disorder care, but also to embodiment in general, which of course is an issue with those who struggle with disordered eating. It's an issue for a lot of folks, though. And so this kind of perspective is applicable across a range of clinical settings. You know, it's something that we will encounter in private practice, too, no matter who we're working with. So I think that's a great example of, well, okay, I'm not an eating disorder specialist, but I will encounter folks that these ideas will be incredibly helpful and supportive for. Yeah, I think especially in the wellness culture, where some of us trying to, to trying to get rid of this, but we're we kind of equate thin with health, and that's not necessarily true, right? That there are many body types, there are many forms of beauty, and it's not about just being thin. Although being thin is fine, also, right? So, I I look forward to to hearing what she has to say, and I think it's important for yoga therapists to, you know, become educated about eating disorders, but, you know, her broader talk, yoga therapy, embodiment, and pathways to healing. Absolutely. We have a couple of other really great keynotes that I just want to touch on. Could you talk a little bit about Sham's talk and Marshawn's talk and Adana's talk? Sure. So we also have the the first one you mentioned is Dr. Sham Ranganathan. And he is also a yoga researcher, but a different kind of of yoga researcher. He really is a scholar of the history and the tradition of yoga. And he brings a wonderful, deep perspective. And like Dr. Cook Catone, he's also a college professor. So we have that really grounded background that he's bringing. And he's going to be discussing the ways in which we can understand how colonization affects the way we move through yoga spaces, the way we move through practice, the way we move through our lives. And I think this is so important for everyone to understand. And Dr. Ranganathan has a very clear way of connecting the dots for us. So I think his talk is going to be absolutely invaluable. You know, every time I see him post on Facebook, I'm blown away. I mean, what the things that come out of his mind are just brilliant. How about Marshawn Feltis? So, yeah, so Marshawn Feltis is, I believe he's from Chicago, so it's really special mm-hmm. to have him presenting at this particular sitar. He has a wonderful, inspiring personal story, and he is someone I sort of think of as a natural activist. And right, so this is another thing that even if you don't think of yourself as an activist, we all are in one way or another. So he is just an inspirational individual. And I just can't wait to see 
what he brings to the conference because it will be based on what he's observed partly Mm -hmm. through the he's coming toward the end of the conference I think he might be the final speaker and so part of what he's going to talk about is what he has observed during the course of the conference and what has inspired him and then how he in turn can inspire the rest of us to be just as much of a change agent as he is. Maybe not just as much, but to be a change agent in the way that he is too. Wow. I just pictured yeah. firecrackers going off. <laughs> All right. Well, we have Adhana in a general session and she's a yoga therapist, but also a U.S. Army major. <laughs> so tell us what she, just briefly what she's going to talk about. Adana McCarthy is an extraordinary individual, Major McCarthy. She is a physician assistant, like you said, in the U.S. Army, and she's going to be bringing that perspective. So talking about, you know, different clinical practice settings, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. So she'll be bringing that into the mix, as well as her deep experience in clinical care, integrating yoga therapy into other kinds of care which she does Mm -hmm. seamlessly. So she's learned a lot of lessons, not just about yoga therapy itself, not just about healthcare itself. You know, this is something that I think is so interesting about all of these speakers that it's, it's not just one narrow lens that they're looking through. And it's not just one narrow lens that, that we will view the material through. They, I think will all, encourage us to see things in a wider way. And and that's what you want from the effort of, of getting yourself to a conference of any kind, right? Is that that opportunity for broader learning. And it reminds me of Mother Nature that through our diversity, there is strength, right? That in nature, that's how nature thrives and survives is because of the diversity in our human minds, the diversity of perspective, but in mother nature, just the diversity of plants and animals and weather patterns that somehow that diversity holds things in balance instead of Mm. being a weakness. So I don't know if you've ever heard of that concept, but I did a talk on it once why we need diversity in yoga therapy and unique perspectives. And we need to have that, that wide tent that allows for so many different ways of clinical care, ways of being in the world. So I agree 100%. So one last little thing, we're trying to keep this not too long, but this year you have a new workshop format. We're not going to have the CICs this year. Right. So in the past, we've had a really fun format called the Common Interest Communities. And this year we're changing it up a little bit And we're offering to kick off the conference a little bit more of a traditional workshop format. So there will be a little bit different style of interaction. There will be one or a couple of strong workshop leaders who are very experienced in their area, and they will lead the discussion around a central idea. And then there will probably be breakouts where small groups talk about that central idea and there will be facilitators who lead folks to sort of consensus is maybe not the right word but to explore these concepts and come up with ideas around them and so again it'll be much more of a traditional workshop Mm. setting yeah and I think that makes sense as we come back together and because it, we have an in-person you know, sessions, but there's also opportunities for online conference. Sounds fantastic. So this again is going to be June 9th through 11th, 2022 at the Lincolnshire Marriott Resort just outside Chicago. And anyone who wants to learn more about the conference, really dig into who are the speakers, what is the format, how much does it cost? What is the difference between the virtual versus the in-person? Are there discounts for people from third world bank countries so that we can be more inclusive? All of that is listed on the website and the web address is www.iayt.org forward slash sitar with a Y 2022. 
iayt.org forward slash S-Y-T-A-R 2022. Thank you, Laurie, for coming today. And we'll see you at Sitar. Yay, I can't wait, Amy. Hello, I'd like to welcome Sue Carter, who is a career biologist and has an appointment at the Indiana University, but also University of Virginia at Charlottesville in a psychology lab studying epigenetics. And for those of you who don't know, Sue is the woman who discovered the relationship between oxytocin and social behavior. And Sue, correct me if I'm wrong, but did it all start with prairie voles? Yes, yes, it (laughs) all started with prairie voles. Well, welcome, Sue. Thank you for coming. We're so happy to have you here. Some people may not know this, but you and Stephen Porges are spouses. So just to to point that connection out too. 52 years. (gasps) Oh my goodness. Well, you are experiencing your research real time with 52 years of connection, right? Yes. So let's begin. I had asked you a question at the beginning before we actually got on the podcast, and that is about the work that you've done regarding mother and child and the first few days of birth and possibly lactation and how, if the the mother is emotionally available and there's oxytocin flowing, this can really almost create a blueprint we think, I would like you to expand, for the child to be able to experience more oxytocin in their life. Maybe you can say it more elegantly than I, but can you just start there and and talk about that? I, I can try. I think there are lots of myths, mysteries, misconceptions about oxytocin that we need to deal with before we actually address your question. Wonderful. Um, the, if you look on the internet, you will find quite a lot of material, most of it repeating over and over again, things that are potentially partially correct or completely wrong. Mm. And my own interest in this subject started at the birth of our first son in 1980. I was working on behavioral endocrinology, which was then sort of a new field. And I was working on female reproductive hormones, which we thought at that time molecules like estrogen were sort of, these Mm -hmm. were the powerful chemicals that regulated behavior. But there were some mysteries that even then that didn't make sense to me, which were things like uh, the experience of an animal seemed to override the hormonal milieu, the hormonal environment. Mm. When my son was born, I was given oxytocin. I also almost certainly experienced natural oxytocin. I was very concerned, and I still am, about the fact that this molecule is given to women at a vulnerable point in life without hardly any research, even today, about the consequences for either the mother or the baby of that treatment. It's called Pitocin in the medical world. Well, Pitocin has been a lifesaver for some people, but it also is a complicated situation because if the body's not ready to give birth and you try to drive the baby out by contractions induced by Pitocin, you sometimes wind up with a Mm C-section. I didn't have one, probably because the doctor was asleep, okay? It was the middle of the night. They had he was in the hospital. They hadn't called him down, and 
eventually the various treatments and my own physiology kicked in. So we have a very wonderfully healthy baby, but one who went through a difficult labor, as did I. And I'm really, you could almost think of this as a kind of birth trauma story for me, because I kept, I'm a scientist and I kept obsessing over what had happened. What had I gone through? I have I'd never been in a hospital before, mind you. I am very much into trying to stay healthy without a lot of medical interventions. So that was not only my first trip to a hospital, it was my first medical intervention in the form wow. of a drug. All right, so, and I'm a scientist and I'm a bit obsessive. That would probably be an understatement. <laughs> so I, I mean, from July 27th, 1980 forward, I have studied oxytocin at every level I could find information. I recreated my own research program, and I was working at that time with a little rodent called the prairie vole. Prairie voles are phenomenally interesting, we've discovered, but we were the first to really bring them into the laboratory and try to understand both their physiology and their behavior. And they're wonderful subjects for laboratory work because they can live in the laboratary pretty much the way they live in nature, in pairs. So we could create these little micro environments um, and they're monogamous, right? They're socially monogamous. Yeah, very maybe bold. not sexually, but socially. Well, the that was a sort of a disappointment to me because I thought they were sexually monogamous. Everyone else said they had to be, if they were monogamous, monogamy in those days meant sex. I've written a very exhaustive paper, which is one of the most widely downloaded papers I've ever written. I think it's like 160,000 people have taken this very detailed science. I don't know if they actually read it, but they were probably intrigued by the fact that there was such a thing as social monogamy. And I'm not using that exactly in the human sense. I'm using it the way biologists to mean do to mean pairs of animals that live together, help to take care of the young, and they have some other remarkable traits that are only found in the kinds of species that do this. But when we got access in the 1980s to DNA fingerprints, unfortunately for the prairie vole, well, maybe fortunately for the prairie vole, because they have what biologists like to call genetic diversity, they can have a litter of four babies, two fathered by the male that lives in the nest with the female and two others with unknown strangers. Now, this is against the sort of uh, Judeo-Christian morality that we live with, but it makes biological sense because yeah. now if it's a bad year, the one or those two males may have a better genetic set of information to pass to the babies and his offspring will survive in theory. Yeah. But the social part of this is what fascinated me. These prairie voles were living together. Once they got together as a pair, they stayed together until they were, as long as they lived, until one or both died. And mortality in nature, this is under natural conditions and prairie environments. It's a pretty harsh environment. There are a lot of predators. And so they don't live forever, but they actually don't form new pair bonds. Females, for example, may mate again, but they don't bring another male oh. usually into their nest. So it's a true social bond. And that fascinated me too. What yeah. in the world? And I was, all of this was happening in independent streams of research and thinking that uh, wasn't in the 1980s fashionable, nor 
how we were looking at hormones and behavior. So anyway, I just became obsessed with oxytocin. Mm. 40 odd years later, it's easy for me to remember. All I have to do is ask my son how old he is. And uh, I know how long I've been on this path. And now what started with the Prairie Vole has become a lot of people's obsession because we need to understand attachment. To get now back to your question, Amy. Right, right. The, yes, something happens in early life. Many things happen, some of them before birth, but a lot of our behavioral programming, which you nicely called a blueprint, is programmed by a series of events that include what's called an epigenetic programming, where genes can be altered. And one of those genes that's very vulnerable is the oxytocin receptor. Mm. The oxytocin itself is pretty stable, but the receptor can be changed by experience. And that experience clearly includes the amount of nurture in early life. So just for the non-scientists out there, what I hear you saying is that in early life, if there were birth trauma or early childhood trauma, your receptors might shut down and therefore that blueprint could follow you throughout your life? They could shut down or they could be upregulated. This is oh, very important. We, When I was having my children in the 80s, I think we were still kind of living in a world that was based on the notion of learning and most thinking that most of what we experienced was learned. Now, learning is not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about an adaptive change that affects everything, not just our behavior, but our physiology, our health, everything in life. And it is for a newborn baby, the typical program is the baby in nature in our historical past would have been given to the mother. In fact, some babies, if you They've done this. If you put the baby on the mother's stomach, the baby will literally crawl. Brand new born baby Mm. will crawl to the nipple and attach. So we are well designed as a species to have a mother-child interaction. Uh, We're also well designed as a species to have support from others. This is really important, and it it helps us to understand why all kinds of therapies and interventions tend to work better when there are safe conditions and others present. This is the essence of what Steve calls the polyvagal theory. Yeah. So, which there's all there are multiple inter connections and interactions between oxytocin and the vagus nerve. So this isn't a trivial association. With with the key part of that being safety. If you want to take only one word, safety is the one I would choose. And I've been saying now for, I, I think I was trying to find when I first started to put this into print, it was at least a decade ago. I was arguing to try to make this a little less technical, a little less chemical. I was trying to explain that oxytocin becomes, its effects become a biological metaphor for safety. Mm. Yeah. So when, when you say the oxytocin receptor sites can basically be downregulated or upregulated, what would it look like if someone had an upregulation. Does that mean that the connection with the mother was so good and the oxytocin was plentiful and now their receptors are wide open, ready mm. to receive long-term? Yeah, we don't really have that kind of data. 
But we can certainly say that in the Prairie Bowl, which has now become sort of a common model for this kind of work, a little extra oxytocin in early life or a little bit more mothering. You can't raise a baby Prairie Bowl without a mother, but you can alter slightly how much behavior she shows to her baby. And what appear to be rather small changes in the first week of life have lifelong consequences for the receptor and for the capacity of that animal to form social bonds later. And this is, of course, profoundly important. And it fits with a very, very large literature in psychology now that basically says there is early behavioral programming based on how we treat our offspring. If you want a peaceful, calm, easygoing baby, you are well advised to give that baby a lot of nurture. Not just, I mean, holding the baby, reducing, if possible, the mother's own stress. The baby, the mother's not the only source, remember, in history of human yeah. behavior. We always had others. Grandmas, aunties, uncles. And, and fathers. And the father in some cultures is involved in some less so. The father may be more emotionally involved than directly involved. And it's extremely variable, of course, mm. and opportunistic. Some fathers are out foraging for resources, working. In some cultures, just finding food or big game versus agriculture, whatever. We are really dependent on others because the mother has to sustain her own life or be supported. And that's true even in the most modern cultures where we have grocery stores and yeah. electricity and so forth. We're still dependent on other. And that's so that when I use the word nurture, I'm trying to differentiate between just mothering Right. which is the prototype for nurture. So even if you're not the mother, humans seeing a baby seem to be really very, very well. It's kind of a dangerous word, but they're so, sort of wired to interact with that baby, to at least look at it, sometimes to want to touch it and so forth. You know, it, it's reminding me of this idea from India that I was taught by my yoga teachers that becoming a yoga therapist is learning how to remother your client to nurture them to provide mm -hmm. that safe space that stable mm -hmm. relationship what do you think of that i think that's brilliant and i totally agree yoga obviously i i assume it's still considered to be at least 5000 years old mm -hmm. as a practice and it had many forms of course breath versus physical exercise kinds of models, but I think it's more effective. I don't know, you would have to tell me if there's any data that actually show that, but I would think that ex the yoga done in some kind of safe social context would be more beneficial. Somebody just published a study on physical therapy and exercise and very serious back pain and showed that it was more effective. The exercise, the same amount, it was quite a controlled study. I don't remember who did it, but it's recent. And they found that the pain diminished more. Same exercise, yeah. more effect. So that's an opening in adulthood too. So we're not totally restricted to what happened to us at birth. We all had birth trauma because one way or another, we had to be extracted from our very comfortable home in the mother's uterus to the outside world, whether it be birth or surgical birth or whatever. And so there's no such thing as a non-traumatic birth. 
but what happens next really matters. So making a baby feel safe is, in my perspective, really important. And we didn't have that kind of thinking. For example, when I was born, babies were taken away from the mother, put into a nursery, wrapped in maybe swaddled, maybe not. We viewed birth over, I would say, the last hundred years as something that was kind of flexible. And we could just do whatever we wanted. And we went through a period of extreme hygiene. So we were like washing babies. And now we know that the bacteria that the mother provides the baby, especially through the birth canal, is critical in programming her microbiota. Now that's totally, totally new. And and that's very connected to Ayurveda, which is the Indian medicine that that the keys to good health is to have good microbiome. Good microbiome and good prebiotics as well. Mm. Uh, We've got to feed those little guys, which I think we've got a lot more to learn about that. But yes, we have this old traditional, not old, ancient, traditional medicine that we are relearning, or even people who know about it may not be able to practice it in modern culture. So we have to figure out, and this applies to yoga as well, what really matters versus what sort of okay and or extra. Mm. What do we, where do we want to put our efforts? Of course, I'm going to argue always that the most important time is the early life experiencing of a child and the mother. And our culture should be protecting that relationship in any way we can. Lactation, of course, is another source of the microbiome. And we should be doing everything we can to help a baby get human milk. Doesn't have to be the mother's milk, but it's probably more consistent with her microbiota if it is. But again, I'm not trying to ever shame anyone who, for whatever reason, was unable to lactate or to nurse their own child, because we humans are so incredibly adaptive. We can get to the same place through many paths. And so we don't want to get stuck and say, oh my God, uh, my mom didn't nurse me, I'm cursed for life. Not true. And that's what I wanted to ask you. Do you think through a therapeutic relationship, a safe stable relationship where there's co-regulation of the nervous system. Can that change the oxytocin receptors? I think so. We're trying to study that right now. I have a collaborator at the University of Virginia. That's why I accepted an appointment there last year. Her name is Jessica Conley. And Dr. Conley has spent her last 12 or more years developing assays, biochemical assays, for the oxytocin receptor epigenetics. Not just the receptor, but it's it, whether it's been adjusted and which direction. And we were discussing this yesterday. I have to depend on her as a source, although I can offer references from her group if somebody really wants to dive into this, it's complicated. But mm-hmm. but once you're once the work is done, you come up with a number, and that number has a very strong relationship to human behavior and even to neural functioning measured by fMRI. Mm, it just does studies that are both behavioral and With her spouse, Jamie Morris, they work on the function of the nervous system 
And there are remarkably strong relationships between oxytocin, the oxytocin receptor, and these kinds of measures that are used in typical imaging studies, and also how those react to social stimuli. So this story, which is a great deal more complicated than I would have ever guessed, is the arrows are pointing in one direction. I think we can be very optimistic that some aspects of this system are plastic, uh, have neuroplasticity and behavioral plasticity. Other aspects, it, it, it's a, a kind of tuning system would be a good way to think about it, almost like a rheostat or a thermostat. And we have a range within which we're restricted. We can't go outside of certain biological constraints, but we have a lot of variability and we have a whole biochemistry of the body, other molecules that are part of this story. And I, I tend not to describe them because it's so easy to get lost in dopamine and serotonin and mm. GABA and all of these other players. It, for my own sanity, right from the start, I realized, well, if I don't stay focused, I, I won't get any place because this is a big kind of complicated story. Mm. But and, and as you said, sorry to interrupt, but as you said, it's difficult to measure oxytocin and we don't even know the mechanism that increases oxytocin. We don't have a full understanding. We do know that the release of oxytocin is stimulated by cervical stimulation at the time of birth, but it's not the cause of birth. Oxytocin is not the first thing that causes birth. We could talk about that. Lactation is the simplest model. There is an anticipatory before the baby touches the breast, mothers will feel milk let down. The reservoir in the breast of milk, of breast milk is filled, and the baby then, by suckling, releases it. And sometimes mothers will have so much milk, it just kind of comes out on its own. So that system, that's two examples. But most people I talk to want to know what else. What else is there? For example, do practices like yoga release oxytocin? And as you and I have discussed, there, as far as I can find in the literature, there's actually only one study it was done in 2013 in India, and it was done in a unique population, so we can't say if it generalizes because the people they studied have been diagnosed with schizophrenia. So, and I believe they were institutionalized and they went through about a month of yoga training. And to nobody's surprise, they were emotionally more stable. And that's probably what really matters. But this group did a measurement, I believe it was blood, before and after, and they got about, they, well, it went from a measurement of, in their, their metric, about two picograms per milliliter, or a little bit more, perhaps, to eight or nine. Well, that's, in one month. In one month. Now, that doesn't prove anything, but the control, they did have a so-called waitlist control, and during that month, without the yoga there was no change in oxytocin. So that's that's a start. You would think, given, however, the number of oxytocin studies that are being done right now, that there would be more research. And I do hope there is more on this topic. Amy and I have talked about why I can't say just y'all come and we'll <laughs> say the oxytocin because it's really complicated. You have to have institutional review boards. You have to have a lot of money to do these assays. They're very expensive. And the conditions need to be very well controlled. And I would add that any study 
of the in this area needs to try to get whatever information they can on early life experience and both adversity and nurture. Mm. And those are not always available and we just don't know. And so and it's pretty hard to do a retrospective study that's accurate. Right. So there are good reasons. There isn't a vast amount of work on this, but given the importance, we need to understand it. And I need to explain why. Because in the literature, you will find what are being called paradoxical effects of oxytocin. Mm. So there are a lot of people uh, all over the world now using oxytocin as an intranasal spray that was originally medically designed to help lactation get started. Interesting. And they're using it in research. And it's perfectly safe in that context. I'm not recommending it to people as therapy because if you use this, any drug over time repeatedly, the system shuts down. And the last thing you want to do mm. is turn off your oxytocin system yeah. or over-methylate its receptor. We just don't understand it well enough yet. That said, some people, most people, given extra oxytocin, have some kind of sort of beneficial outcome. Like what? Oh, they'll feel better. They'll say they're more social. They'll engage in more social contact with others spontaneously. Mm -hmm. They may engage in more eye contact, but here's the big... You know, <laughs> We're waiting. <laughs> if they have an early history of adversity, that extra oxytocin may have negative consequences. One of the best demonstrations of this was postpartum depression, a study done at the University of North Carolina, where they, were, they took care to try to find out if there was a trauma history. And not to my surprise, but apparently to theirs, I'll explain why I wasn't surprised, the people with trauma history actually seem to get a bit worse. So we are not at a point yet where we can hand out oxytocin sprays to everybody and say, hey, this is going to make you well, especially if there's a long trauma history or severe trauma history. And we don't even know exactly what that is, but something happens. My own personal theory, which for which there's animal data, is that the oxytocin, we know this, oxytocin is part of a system. It's a most recently evolved, it's kind of a modern molecule, but it evolved from a, a series of other molecules that are very, very similar. One of those is called vasopressin. Yeah. And there are specific vasopressin receptors. Before I would talk to Amy, I sent her all these. They are deep fascinating. Receptors. And so vasopressin, the vasopressin system, sometimes it works like oxytocin in acute situations. But chronically, vasopressin tends to be associated with stress and anxiety and mobilization or even shutting down using polyvagal theory type terminology. Or now, even aggression, right? In animals, it definitely increases aggression. I, I view aggression, at, at least in the animal world, as more of a defensive mechanism like setting yeah. a boundary? Or reacting to fear. Mm. And I think that probably applies to a lot of human aggression, but aggression in humans, the same activity can have more than one emotional origin. So a person may be, appear to be aggressive because their nervous system is in a high state of arousal mm. and they're trying to protect it. Or they may have what used to be called instrumental aggression, and they are deliberately fighting with someone else because they're boxers and they're being paid for it, or they're 
warriors and they have no choice. They've been conscripted to go out and engage in what we call aggression, but for which they may have no stomach whatsoever. So we're, we have to be really careful, but let's assume we're working with a defensive aggression or a defensive anxiety. If that nervous system is tuned up into that state of feeling anxious or already wired to by the personal history, then adding oxytocin may go not to its own receptor, the so-called oxytocin receptor, but to the vasopressin receptor, and that's been shown in Mm. animal models. Then what comes out at the other side is not peaceful loving behavior, it's more aggression. And so the use of oxytocin as a medicine, the way typical pharmaceuticals are done, is not yet widely practiced. I think for a lactating woman, as it was used to help start lactation, but it's not a molecule you want to keep on using. And that's true of almost every drug. They, they're down reg- their receptors are downregulated. So we don't understand oxytocin very well. We do know in birth that nipple stimulation can release it and it feeds forward under those conditions. But when you get into situations of chronic long-term use, which is how drugs are often used, then you're in trouble. So what I feel we have to do is start to think more biologically, more naturally about our bodies. And anything that promotes health is probably, if not releasing oxytocin, and it doesn't always, it may be making it more easily used. That's where this receptor comes into our story. So these more kind of indigenous lifestyle medicine cultures, we think could contribute to increasing oxytocin. If the lifestyle is a safe one, yeah. if it has a social component. Mm. Now, for better or worse, we went through a pandemic and we, in some places still going through pandemics. Uh, maybe we'll see them again. We have gone into uh, treatments that were isolation. And for some people, that meant isolation with a social net, and for some, it did not. Right. And I think that there's good reason to be concerned that those who were totally isolated and didn't feel safe had a different physiological experience of that strange, if you will, rather. Yeah protracted experiment that we've been part of. So, and there's huge individual differences too. Some people do pretty well in isolation and others don't. And we don't really understand what's the source of that. At least I don't. Yeah. So can we go back to something you just talked about that, certain lifestyles that in your perspective might be kind of more natural and socially based. How does that impact the psycho neuroendocrinology? I mean, do you have an idea about that mechanism? Well, we can only guess um, because experiments of the sort that we're talking about are not ethical. Mm. Uh, We already know enough that we would not deliberately, as an experiment, put someone into social isolation. Now, we use that as a punishment, and I would say that's probably the wrong way to go myself. If your goal is to rehabilitate or or bring that person back into society, you don't want them to have been tremendously stressed by isolation. Um, You're 
if your goal is to prepare them for some kind of ritualistic execution, I guess that's sort of how it's used mm-hmm. in our culture, um, then I don't know, even that isn't going to go real well. Um, we're like prairie voles, we're social mammals and we form multiple social bonds. We're not a single bonding kind of species. We have bonds with you know, family, with friends. I'm not sure our body can even identify family versus friends so much as safe versus not so safe mm-hmm. or threatening. And we are adaptively chemically and neurally wired to deal with different kinds of environments. So our first law of nature is survival. We do survive. We are almost to 8 billion people, right? And that's more than doubled in my lifetime. And so we have, we can survive anything, but the quality of life, which is what I hope we all appreciate, that's important too. That's not going to be the same in a person who's isolated or who's psychologically been through a lot of trauma. We, we can help each other. The, the cure, the The treatment is not oxytocin. It's allowing oxytocin to work. Tell me more about that. I love that line. The cure is not oxytocin. It's allowing oxytocin to work. Yes, to allow it to function because it is, at least based on our animal and human research now, it's a system that's beautifully designed to make us feel better to make us able, I would use the word, to have the capacity for positive social experiences. But if this individual that we're talking about has been through early life experiences that calibrated them, I always kind of like to imagine us dialing, calibrated our receptors, then we may not be able to either easily release oxytocin or to use it if we do release it. Mm. And we're certainly, as I see it, some time ahead of oxytocin as a chronic medicine. It does probably have its place under acute conditions, but we still don't even know, even in these women who were in postpartum depression, it didn't make them better. Um, very disappointing, as you can imagine, to the yeah. researchers doing that and to everybody, but predicted if you were aware of the biological system. So we're, you know, it's time in history when we are still in the discovery phase. Mm-hmm. Now, the ancient medicines, they were based on biology. And if they didn't work, if there was some posture that had a tremendously negative consequence over time, most people would stop doing it, right? If I try to put my foot around my neck, at first I couldn't do it. <laughs> and if I did, it wouldn't be good for my hip bone. Um, or my the joint in my hip. So uh, things that work are they're, they're sort of weeded out or, or propagated by the success. There's certainly a lot of negative things like alcohol that have also stayed with us forever, at least chronic alcohol use. And so we we have a very big brain. And our brain allows us to adapt, but it sits, our cortex sits on top of a brainstem that's pretty biological and pretty much programmed by our life experiences, not through classical learning, but through changing state. Mm 
yeah. through moving us into. And then in these other states, we can learn. We can become more intelligent. We can build new technologies. We can use those technologies for good or bad. In your opinion, would it be safe to say that through a yoga, yoga therapy practice, and also what I call changes in, in lifestyle, if we could get into the state where we just had a sense of well-being and what we call in yoga salutogenesis or eudaimonia, if we could get into that state more often and, and kind of track our progress towards, okay, this helped me get there or this knocked me out. Do you think that would be helpful? I, I do. I think uh, using our bodies as an experiment though, is a rather slow way to decide what to do. That's where the wisdom of the ages, the wisdom of teachers the support of knowledge is so important. You know, I've had a number of yoga classes. I don't routinely practice yoga. I do a lot of related types of stretching and moving. I would do better if I had a teacher. I'm certain mm -hmm. of that. If it were easy for me to access a, a person who, as you say, keep, we keep saying this, makes you feel safe. Now, you don't want false safety, and safety is a, you know, it's a double-edged sword because you can become naive or gullible and be led into things that are by apparent safety. We want safety so much we'll seek it, whether it's real or not sometimes. Yeah. That's the case of certain kinds of drugs, for example. They give a sensation of safety, but the truth is more in the long-term benefits. The other bit of this that is often forgotten is that short and long-term benefits and acute and chronic stress have different biology. So if I want to build my muscles, one thing I do is I have an elliptical and I use my elliptical now go after this interview, I'll go down and take a walk in my basement or on the first floor. And I'll use as my companion the internet because I find it incredibly boring to exercise alone. I can't keep it up. But I know if I were again in a situation, which at the moment I'm not, to use a kind of social environment, I would even gain more benefits. Mm. So there's yoga is wonderful because it's it's tried and tested by a tradition. It yeah. is its mechanisms aren't that well understood. Mm -hmm. Some people will argue it's mostly breath work. Others will say, oh, it's you know you've got to have flexibility and all of that's probably true. But again, it, it has to be done in an environment where the body can grow and restore itself. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that's different about yoga therapy versus maybe a, a regular yoga class on the internet or, or maybe a group yoga class at a studio is our main thing that we go by is yoga is relationship to quote Desika Char. Yoga is relationship. And that, you know, whatever breath work or types of postures or chanting or meditation that we choose, which we know regulates the nervous system, your Stephen Porges is a master at all of that. But if we just take the relationship piece connected to what you've told us today about oxytocin, vasopressin, maternal bonds, birth trauma, early childhood experience, a lot of people would say that a strong, stable, kind, compassionate relationship could do most of the healing. Well, without it, it's probably not going to be as effective or yeah. just as the intranasal oxytocin didn't always work. It may, for some people, it's a small subset who are 
so traumatized that they can't even use their own body systems, but it happens. I have given, I was giving a talk a couple of years ago in a group of adults, and one of them happened to have been a lactational consultant in her previous life. And she was telling me about the problems she had with young women with babies who had severe trauma history. And when they would put the baby to the breast, they had terrible psychological experiences, some of them. Mm. And I think that's the same system. It's saying you, you can't fool Mother Nature, you know. So now there will almost certainly be ways to get around that to help that woman feel safe. That's always, the mother's always a woman. To help her feel well enough that she can then lactate without it bringing back memories of some kind of, it may be memories so deep they aren't even cognitive, emotional, physical memories of earlier trauma of mm. assault, people who've had a long or, or particularly traumatic history may have special problems. And those, we're, we're so new to all of this in a psychological sense that we expect each teacher knows these things. Well, how could they know, right? They've got yeah. their life experience and whoever they've worked with. But... I, I'm really, as I said, I'm really optimistic because it's a powerful system. It was op- the oxytocin system almost certainly was critical to allow the human nervous system and the cortex to evolve. Mm-hmm. I've written a very long paper on that um, in which I argued that there would be no human behavior. There would be no speech if it wow. weren't for the effects of oxytocin on the brain. And that's based on animal research that's very solid, it's very clear. So in order for the nervous system to grow to its optimal current form, it needs oxytocin. But our ancestors, our evolutionary ancestors, went through a kind of a selection process. It's called an evolutionary theory. And... Those that had, this is a little loose, but optimal traits, they, those survived. And we are a product of that evolution. We are a product of positive experiences. We're not, we've survived in spite of war. We've survived in spite of certain viruses and our bacteria have adapted to be our friends. So we have these so-called probiotics. So it's not a pessimistic story, but it's one that we have to understand in the context of acute experiences, short-term experiences and long-term. Biology acts on both, but most of what For example, people trying to use yoga for healing, they're interested in chronic problems. They're not trying to fix a broken leg or a cut finger. And that's where all of the sort of new medicine that I know about is pointing and heading. People are realizing this. It took a long time. Medicine's new the way we practice it. Old medicine, not so new. Ayurvedic medicine, very old, very based on evolutionary principles, really, because it survived. Anything that survived that was too hard on the body is not going to be with us very long. So we were looking for some middle ground. We're not trying to become, when we use something like yoga, Most people, some people are trying to have perfect bodies, but many you're telling me are there because they're working with ways of calming their nervous system so they can be in more optimal states 
And this is important in both sexes, but women are well documented to be more susceptible to anxiety and depression. Mm. And I would wager that there are far more women in yoga classes than men. Now, the men would benefit just as much, but yeah. their nervous system is designed a little bit differently, not totally different, but enough that, for example, under stress, they males may be more likely to sort of revert to a vasopressin mm. type uh, survival strategy. This has been called fight and flight, for example. Now, women will run too. So it's, you remember, I keep saying things that are done in the short term are very different than those in the long term. And that's true of natural biological events, and that's certainly true of medicine. So very, very effective drugs like penicillin or something that saves you from an infection are not something you want to live on. Yeah. You'll destroy your microbiota. You'll be sick from another source of problems. And hormones are like that. They're, they're transient. Even in our own lives, women experience from puberty to menopause a different physiology than they experience postmenopausally. And the, I, I experienced that the last yeah. 10 years. I've just had these dramatic shifts happening. Yeah. Well, nobody can tell you. I search this literature all the time. No one can say with assurance what's the very best thing to do. And Everybody, it's individualized, right? It, well, it will have to be. But at the moment, we're looking at general patterns. So you're going to, if you're postmenopausal woman and having a lot of symptoms, hot flashes or dysphoria yourself, you're probably going to go to a doctor, if you're lucky, to have access to a good physician. And they, if they've had experience or if they know the literature, will give you their best guess. But that literature is changing right in front of our eyes. Right. And um, we don't know. We are concerned, all of us, about safety. But we're also concerned about our bones, for example. Okay. The so unintended consequences. Unintended consequences. Now, the good news, oxytocin, when it's working well, benefits bone growth and restoration mm. and is very well documented in animals and in women that low oxytocin levels are associated with osteoporosis or osteopenia. So I really think we are going to see a new medicine. I hope it's based on understanding basic biology not trying to just throw some kind of hormone at the problem or the situation. Because right. menopause is normal, but losing your bone mass is not a good thing. I don't care how naturalistic your life is. So we have, we have to understand, and oxytocin promotes muscle strength too, mm -hmm. another big thing in yoga. So, but you've got to use those muscles and those bones. You can't just take the hormone right. and in bed, right? It's not going to work. So we're, it's a little more dynamic than most people would like this problem. They'd like a simple one. I would like a simple one, a simple solution. Just tell me what to take. I'll take it and I'll be fine. But that is potentially dangerous. So we're forced to self-educate. We're forced to press our political and medical systems, which we're not doing enough of, to give us more information, especially on women's health, I would argue. Yeah. We've, we've treated medicine as if one size fits all. And as we're saying here, sex is a continuum but some pieces of it, like the chromosomes, are not continuous. Right. So most people are either XX or XY. We hardly know anything about how that works. It's, I read that literature all the time. It's, it's shocking. And 
and there's no money in understanding it because it's not a drug. So pharma, pharma is motivated by profit and by the investors. And I guess that's fine, but it does not give us these natural medicines that you and I are so interested in. There's really very little profit in yoga anything yeah. it's a non-profit <laughs> well i think what we have to do is somehow through the the research show that a long-term yogic lifestyle and daily yoga practice can make people healthier thus reducing healthcare costs well i think there's a good guess that's true right yeah. but i don't know if that's been documented yeah, because long, long-term research is rarely funded. Right. <laughs> Longitudinal 10-year, 15, 20-year studies are expensive. Well, and we really are, you really would like it to be a lifetime. Yeah. Um, and there are lots of practices. Uh, Steve Porges is very big on play as a neural exercise. Children should be encouraged to play. I think we can say that with confidence. But they can't play in the street, right? Yeah. It's a perfect analogy. We've got to use, again, our cortex, which is very useful, and make judgments. Uh, And I, I personally favor, this is just my prejudice, things that have been around for a long time, rather than immediately going to the latest drug or even the latest kind of somatic therapy that might be something extreme that would damage the body. And there are probably some of those out there right now that we could identify that are okay for young, healthy people. But if I go on a extreme, I go to one of these clubs where they put me through extreme exercise, all bets are off as to whether I'm doing a good thing or not. So <laughs> lifestyle and starting early, and I mean, there are rules here. We need to nurture our kids. We need to play with our kids and let them play with the other children if they can. We need to provide a perspective that isn't just this moment, yeah. but puts time into it. And wonderful thing about oxytocin that's been shown in in rat studies is that oxytocin in rats promotes the capacity to accurately identify threat Mm. to tell danger from safety and that's something that can easily get distorted in our nervous system so people let's say after a period of two years of isolation, which we never expected, um, might start to see the whole world as threatening. Right. And so they can't just like <laughs> yeah. run back into... Society. I have a little bit of that going on. I have to tell you, I, uh-huh. I went out and about the other day and I just, I felt vulnerable out there. <laughs> oh, me too, me too. I think we have to recognize how beautifully designed our nervous system is to protect us. Mm. There's a wonderful therapy called uh, internal family systems that Schwartz designed. He, He teaches people to honor their defensive systems, not to fear them, put them into a, in a sense, make your defenses feel safe so that you can move out of that state into a state of real safety where you can be social, sleep, and so forth. Digest, reproduce. Well, Sue, I've kept you longer than I asked you to gift us with today. And I just want to thank you for coming. Such an interesting conversation. I think you've shown us how complex oxytocin and and all other hormones are. And There's just so many things to think about because clearly we don't have answers. Thank you, Amy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I want to thank Sue Carter for coming on the show today. I felt a little bit like I was 
interviewing kind of a superstar researcher. And I think the work that she's doing not only informs us as yoga therapists and yoga teachers, specifically about trauma, early childhood experience, birth, mothering, nurturing, therapeutic relationship. There was so much packed into this episode that upon first glance, you might think, what does this all have to do with yoga? But when you really understand what we're doing in yoga therapy with respect to lifestyle medicine, with respect to safety, again, therapeutic relationship, co-regulation of nervous system, and then that didn't even get into the lifestyle principles of, of Ayurveda, looking at microbiome and all of that. There were so many connections here today that can inform us as yoga teachers, yoga therapists, even Ayurvedic practitioners. And conversely, what I found fascinating, I came away with thinking it's too complex to even understand how it all works at some level, knowing that it's been around for 2000 to 5,000 years and it's still here and it still seems to be working. That might have to be enough for us. We may not be able to break down the social biology, the chemistry, the lifestyle, the trauma, like how do you even put that into a study and who's going to fund it? Because studies get funded so that people can make money off the results of the study. And there's really no money to be made here. So unfortunately, I'm not sure that we're going to get long-term longitudinal studies that prove the wisdom of the ancient traditions and lifestyles. So I think in the meantime, it's just a good idea to live a healthy, stable, easeful life where we can stay regulated within our own nervous system, where we can co-regulate with others for social behavior, creating more oxytocin in the system and call it a day. <laughs> That's what I got out of today. Just trust those ancient systems. The science is very complex. It probably isn't going to get funded anytime soon, but we know it works because we feel better. We feel more connected to one another feel more connected to ourselves, and in some cases, feel connected to something larger than ourselves. So thank you, Sue, for giving us so much food for thought today. We appreciate the work that you're doing in the world and your passion for decades and decades in the field of social biology and oxytocin. Please don't forget to sign up for our newsletter mailing list, where we give you a free gift every single week. It's usually something that the guest has been talking about, like a book chapter or an article or an infographic. Check out the show notes for that. Thank you for listening today. Don't forget, we have a new YouTube channel called Optimal State with Amy Wheeler. We also have a new Patreon page where you can support us to bring you the most excellent content and that is Optimal State and the Yoga Therapy Hour Patreon page. Also, you could write us a review on most major platforms that host podcasts. Give us five stars if you appreciate the show and tell us what you love so that we can do more of that. Finally, we support several nonprofit organizations through this podcast. See the show notes to understand how you can help. If you'd like to be a guest or a sponsor for this program, contact us at the email welcome at theoptimalstate.com. Welcome at theoptimalstate.com. And finally, a special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria. And Peter Morley, 
who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.